Jesus is speaking more directly to what has to happen for people to enter into his kingdom. That he must be lifted up upon a cross. That he must be the substitute. He has to take upon himself the sting of death. He has to take upon himself the poison of sin on the cross. So there's little doubt in the minds of the commentators that when Jesus says to Nicodemus that I, the Son of Man, must be lifted up even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that he's referring not simply to his glorification and his exaltation, but he's referring primarily to the cross. When we sing, lift high the cross because we are people, ladies and gentlemen, who are snake bit. who have a poison that goes into the depth of our souls in our fallen humanity. And our only hope is the cross. And that's why when we come into the sanctuary, our mind is on the cross and on the one who was lifted up for us and for our sins that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, there's, there's something significant about the word order here in John 3, 15, that whoever believes in Him should have eternal life. No. But first, what is stated is the negative. Whoever believes in the one who is lifted up won't perish. Do you see how that draws the parallel exactly from the situation in the wilderness. These people who were uh, bitten by these poisonous snakes were going to die. They were in a predicament where they were bent on perishing. And so the remedy that God gave was a remedy to preserve them from certain destruction. And what Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus is, we're in that same state by nature. That apart from Christ, apart from the cross, we are as exposed to perishing and destruction as those people were who were bitten by deadly snakes. Jesus is saying, as many who believe on me, they won't perish. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This surely is the most famous verse in the New Testament. It's the one that people color their hair all different kinds of shades and hold up in signs at sporting events, John 3.16. It's probably the most distorted verse in all of the New Testament as well. Because people who love the universality of this verse hate the particularity of this verse. And let me show that to you. It begins by saying something about the love of God and the object of God's affection. God so loved what? The world. And let me finish this for you according to contemporary understandings of John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave Christ and saves everybody in the world. People draw from this text a doctrine of universal salvation that God loves the world so much, He saves everybody. But obviously that's not what the text says. And those who are particularist and Arminian say that God loved the world enough to provide a way of salvation for everybody in it. Let's get rid of this election business and predestination doctrine. 
The Bible doesn't, John 3 doesn't say that either. What John 3 says is that God's love is so deep and so profound. He loved the world enough to send His only begotten Son. Now let me tell you what this doesn't mean. He did not love the world enough to send five saviors. Jesus, Buddha, Mohammed, Confucius. And yet our culture tells that if God were really loving, He would provide avatars galore, that He would provide a smorgasbord of salvation where everybody can believe their own religion and it's okay because God loves the whole world enough that He's not so narrow-minded, not so inclusive or exclusive that He requires faith in Christ. Because doesn't the Bible say that God loves the world? Yes, the Bible said He loves the world. And He loves the world how much? Enough to send His monogenes. Enough to send His one and only Son. I warn people that at the end of their life, if they stand before God, they better not say, God, why were you not loving enough to provide 15 saviors in the world? Can anybody read the story of Christ against the background of fallen humanity, against the constant opposition to God the Father that is raised by fallen creatures in His work? I say to people, consider this scenario. Suppose, suppose that there actually is a God in heaven. And suppose this God in heaven created the whole world and everybody in it. And suppose among the birds and the fish and the animals, he gave the most exalted position in all of creation to this one to whom he gives his image called human beings. And he says to them, you will be holy even as I am holy. And suppose 15 minutes after he makes them, they revolt against him. After he says, if you do this, you will die. And they do that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to provide a way to escape that judgment. And he speaks to Abraham out of paganism, brings him to himself. He says, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. Suppose he does that. And then he blesses all of the descendants of Abraham and then expands to a whole nation and said, through this nation, I'm going to bless the whole world. But this nation repeatedly turns against God. And so God sends prophets to these people and tells them to come back to him, to come back to him as as an unfaithful spouse returns to their partner. And they kill the prophet. And then finally, this God says, I'll tell you what, I love you so much that even though you are stiff-necked people, I'm going to send my eternal, only begotten Son into this planet, and I'm going to subject Him to you. And He sends His Son, and the people rise up against His Son and crucify Him. And yet God loves them enough in all of this that while they're in the act of killing them, God takes the sins of His people and transfers them to the death of His own Son. And said, look, if you'll put your trust in Him, if you'll confess your sins and you believe in Him, if you turn your gaze upon Jesus and you do that, here's what. No death, no punishment, I'm going to give you eternal life with no pain, no tears, no evil, no darkness. Now suppose he did that. Would you have the guts to come up to God and say, God, you haven't done enough 
or this world that hates you? Are you one of those that gets angry when you hear there's only one way to God? The question is, why should there be one? Not why is there only one. It's why is there one at all? Well, God loves the world enough to send the only one. He doesn't love the world enough to say you can ignore the only one. We need to understand that. Because everything out there in that culture says, if God only provides one way of salvation, one Savior, then God doesn't really love the world. But think about the depths of the love that God has displayed by giving us Christ, whose name is not worthy to be mentioned in the same breath with that of Mohammed or Buddha or Confucius or anybody else, as God has one Son who from all eternity beheld the glory of the Father and yet, as the creed we read this morning said, for us and for our salvation, came from the bosom of the Father to be lifted up on a cross that anyone who puts their trust in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is our natural state. We're in the darkness, and there's nothing that terrifies us more than the appearance of light. But Jesus is introduced as the light of the world in the very first chapter of this gospel. And this light shines into the darkness. It shines into people who are groveling in pain, who are perishing in their sin, who love the darkness because their deeds are evil. That's our nature, we're told, that we are by nature, beloved, children of darkness. It is against the nature of a child of darkness to come to the light because we know what the light represents. It represents exposure. It represents humiliation. Even as Christians, we still have that tug at our heart where we look for that place to hide in the darkness rather than seeking the light of Christ. God said, this is my condemnation. I sent the light, but you didn't want the light. But all who are of the light, who come to the light, who embrace the light, will not perish, but have everlasting life.